The last time I tried anything voxel game related was just over two years ago when I tried to make Minecraft in one week. But all that project really was was a world generator where you were able to place and remove blocks. You know, there was no actual gameplay. So I've been wanting to just revisit this project so I could actually implement these things that I've always wanted to add to it. For example, mod support, actual gameplay, and most importantly of all, multiplayer. Some of these things I haven't really done much with before, so I thought it might be interesting to sort of take you along with me as I try to build a voxel game from the ground up. And the entire thing's gonna be open source on GitHub, so for free to take a look or contribute if you want to. So anyways, let's make a voxel game. Starting with literally an empty window, the first thing I wanted to do was to get something drawn onto it. And to do this, I'm using OpenGL, an API that allows your program to interact with the GPU. How this works, just to get something drawing, is first of all, you have to define the vertex coordinates of some shape, such as this rectangle here, and then store these coordinates into an array. And then, using a bunch of OpenGL functions, you can then send this data to the GPU. And once it's there, using some more calls to open GL, you can finally draw it. But what's going to be drawn is just a shape at those exact coordinates, and there's nothing that can be done with this, like you can't move it around or anything. In order to do this, a thing called shaders can be used. These are just little programs written in something called the OpenGL shading language, and are run each time you draw something using OpenGL. In the most basic of cases, these are split into two parts, vertex shaders and fragment shaders. The vertex shader is what is used to apply transformations to every single bleed but not vertex of a scene, for example translation and rotation. And after this the fragment shader is run, which fills in the pixels in between the vertices using either colour or texture. For example here I'm using the vertex shader to move the rectangle to the left, and then I'm using the fragment shader to colour it in. This might seem weirdly primitive, but drawing something and applying a shader to it is actually all that is needed to implement a first person camera view. The first step of doing this is taking the current 2D rendering we have and instead making it so that it renders in 3D. This is done in the vertex shader, where you take the position of the player and also the positions of an object's vertices in the world and do some weird matrix maths to map them between different coordinate systems. Eventually, the object in question will have its vertices mapped from the 3D world positions to the 2D coordinates of your screen, making it appear 3D. The next step is taking player input and making it so it changes where the world is being rendered from. For mouse input, it means reading the position of it within the window each frame and then rotating the camera accordingly. This can be seen working with the code here. With keyboard input, it gets a little bit more interesting. Let's just say this is a top-down perspective of the world, and the player is pressing W to move forwards. As the world is in 3D, there is a possible X, Y, and Z plane for the player to move in, so we need to calculate how much they move in each direction. This can be done using trigonometry, where the player's movement vector can be visualised using this triangle. Using the player's Y rotation as theta, the width and height of this triangle can be calculated using the trigonomic equations. After applying them, the triangle's width is how much the player should move in the X direction, and the triangle's height is how much the player should move in the Z direction, and adding these numbers to the player's position makes them go forwards. With the first person camera done, I felt it was a good time to implement basic networking and multiplayer support. This is done using sockets, which are endpoints for sending and receiving messages over some network, such as the internet. So the first step of adding multiplayer is making it so the client is able to actually connect to the server. On the client side, this means creating a packet and marking it as a connection request, and then sending that over to the server. The server will then check to see if there's any room for this client, and if there is, then some basic information about them is stored into an array, such as their IP address. In response, the server will send back to the client the array index of where the information is stored, of which is considered the client ID. This client ID can be used for future messages from this client to the server, which will tell the server who sent the message. For example, if the client wishes to disconnect, it can create a packet, mark it as a disconnect request, and then add the client ID to it. When the server receives this packet, it can look at the client ID and then remove the corresponding information about that client from the array, which then frees it for future connections. This can be seen working here. When I run the server and the client, so you can see acknowledgements that the messages are being passed between them, like the connection requests and other players joining and leaving the game.
The only downside to this current system is that there's no authorization, and so it's incredibly insecure. For example, there's nothing stopping client 1 sending a disconnect request saying that it's actually client 2, because there's no way to tell which client this message came from. But for now I just want something that works, and so authenticating these messages is a task for another time. Anyways, the next step of adding multiplayer is making it so players are able to see the other players moving around. To do this, I can store a list of positions on both the server and the client, corresponding to the position of entities in the world, which includes players. So then every frame of the game, each client can send their player positions to the server along with the client ID. The server can use the client ID as an index of the entity array, setting its new position. This array index of the entity array can be considered the entity's ID number. So with every tick of the server for each entity, it can broadcast the entity ID along with its position to every client. Finally, using the entity IDs with its positions, the clients can then update their own entity array to be synchronised with the server's entity array. With this implemented, each client now knows the positions of all the other players in the world, and so can render something at these positions and watch them as they move around. In other words, the game now has basic multiplayer support. At this point, we now have the ability to render stuff, control a first person camera, and also send messages between the clients and the server over a network. So now it's time to implement probably the most important part of any blocky building game, and that is the actual Voxley world itself. For now, this just means solving a couple of problems. First of all, we need some way to actually store the data about the world in memory, and then secondly, there needs to be a way to actually render it. And while doing both these things, it also needs to be very efficient to update. For example, when the player breaks or places blocks, they should see this straight away without any delay, as this will be a poor gameplay experience. These problems can be solved by splitting the world into chunks, meaning that rather than storing the world data in one massive array or something, rather it's stored in much smaller sections. In our case, this will be a 32 cubed area of blocks. But what is a block in terms of how it's stored? For now, in our case, this will be a one byte number, where a number corresponds to a block type. For example, zero could be air, one could be grass, and two could be a dirt block. By doing it this way, it means that each chunk storing their own array of blocks is around 32 kilobytes in size, meaning that we can store a lot of them without taking up too much memory. So that's how the store blocks, but how do we draw them? The obvious but silly approach would be to loop through all of the block positions in the chunk, move a cube to that position, and then draw every single block individually. Although this works, it would be very inefficient, as it would mean doing over 30,000 draw calls per chunk. On top of this, as you can see, most of the blocks being rendered would actually be inside the chunk, meaning the player wouldn't see them anyway. There is a much better way though, and that is to generate a single mesh of blocks per chunk, adding only the block faces that are actually exposed to it. Not only would this mean just one draw call per chunk, but also a lot less to render, as the block faces inside of the chunk would not get drawn like they were before. To generate this mesh, given the chunk you look at every single block in it, and then for each one you look at its neighbouring blocks. If the neighbouring block is transparent, like an air block or a water block, then you add those vertex coordinates for that block face to an array. For example, take these four blocks here. As you can see, some of their block faces, which I've coloured in red, are neighbouring other sort of blocks, and so these faces would not get added into the mesh. On the other hand, the other block faces, which I've coloured in blue, are actually exposed, as in not facing any solid blocks, meaning these faces would actually get added into the final mesh. And what you are left with is sort of a shell around the chunk, which can then be rendered. The problem with this approach is that it can be pretty slow to generate this geometry, which is one of the main reasons that the world is split into chunks, as generating this mesh for an entire world would take a very long time, but doing it for just a single chunk is much quicker. Although this approach works perfectly fine for most cases, it is actually very far from optimal. While the number of draw calls is very small, the amount of quads being rendered per draw call is very high. With algorithms like greedy meshes, this could be very much improved, but for now it's working fine, so there's no need for that kind of thing just yet. Anyways, right now, all of this world stuff is being done entirely on the client side, but the end goal of this project is to have a multiplayer voxel game. This means that the world should be created and updated on the server, sending chunk data to currently connected clients, which would allow the players to see and modify the same world. As networking is pretty new to me, I wasn't 100% sure how to approach this, so I went with something that just about works for now, and that is the server stores a map of chunks, and clients send requests to the server asking for chunks at certain positions. 
The server will then generate some terrain for that chunk if it doesn't exist yet and then send it over to them. This would allow the client to generate mesh data for the chunk and then render it. And while doing all this, it also needs to be reliable, because if a client doesn't receive the world data for a certain position, then they cannot render anything there, and so there's going to be holes in the world. To get around this, I'm using a library called Enet for networking, which allows for reliable UDP sockets, meaning that once the server sends data, you can be pretty sure that the client actually receives it, and so hopefully there are going to be no holes or chunk errors or whatever. So anyways, after all this, clients are able to receive the same world data and play around in the same world, and so I'm pretty happy with this prototype multiplayer voxel game engine thing. But there's still a long way to go and a lot to do, such as being able to actually break and place blocks, but that's going to be a job for the next episode. Also, as mentioned at the start of the video, the entire thing is open source on GitHub, so feel free to look at the code or even contribute to the project if you want to. But before we finish, quick shout out to my current patrons, so thank you Killer Crazy Man, Nate Brown, Hayden, Dan Twitchett, Timothy Gibbons, Benjamin Marque, Dutt, Timo Schrader, Alan Fernandez, Michael Kirsch, Lucas Derenberger, and Neil Blakely Milner. Thank you all for the support. So anyways, once again, thank you for watching, and I'll see you all next time.